Hey there, Michael. Thanks for joining us here on the Make Math Moments That Matter podcast. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing great and really excited to be here. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. We have been looking forward to this uh, opportunity for quite some time. Uh, originally, we had uh, chatted a few months back. We had a couple you know, things in the schedule that kind of got in the way. But before we dig into that, uh, why don't you tell people a little bit more about yourself? Where are you coming to us from? Uh, what is your role in education? And uh, just kind of paint the audience a little bit of a picture of uh, where Michael Finley's coming to from right now. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm currently, and I'm in my first year as an academic dean over the math and science departments at a K-12 school in uh, Southern California, in the Orange County area. Um, so stepped into that this year, actually it was announced last year after teaching here for two years. Um, and uh, really excited to kind of be stepping into this new role, leading, uh, uh, helping a team lead a change there. So um, yeah, they probably want it. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Awesome stuff. Um, how did you get into teaching? Like, like just fill us in on some of the background there too. Like, like, were you, you know, were you a math teacher like before, you know, became the academic dean? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I actually started out um, in, in the corporate world. So uh, majored in finance in college, went into analytics and consulting, um, actually wasn't a wasn't a real fan of math class through most of my uh, my school career, uh, but ended up in a role where I used and relied on mathematics quite a bit. Um, and it was actually through that process where I ended up getting more and more into uh, education and going, hey, there's a real there's a real need here for um, when you see the output of students and when they're in a career setting, the how they're actually going to use the things that they've learned. Um, I felt like, okay, that's a place I'm really fascinated with. And, and even more so why maybe I wasn't, um, why I didn't think I might've even been capable in, mm. in math coming out of school. And yet when it came to practice, oh, wow, like I can do this, um, in the real world, in a pretty demanding mathematics, uh, field, a field that relies on a lot of math. So hmm. that's really interesting. And, you know, a, a connection that I've made over the years, I've found that a lot of creative people that I bumped into in life, uh, you know, have kind of shied away from mathematics. And it's really interesting to me because you would think mathematics is so creative and it's so interesting, but yet hmm. It seems like the the traditional school experience may have, you know, potentially pushed away some of those, you know, more creative. I, I found some people that are very artistic, for example, when you think about it, like mathematics is all about patterns and it's all about, you know, like there's so many, so many, um, you know, art type, beautiful things going on there. Think of the golden ratio and so forth. And yet I feel like there's so many bright individuals out there that sort of didn't feel like it fit them. And then there's guys like me and, you know, John kind of, you know, identifies himself as, as probably very similar. Like I just did what I was told. So like I was what you would consider, I thought I wasn't very creative, but in, in reality it was just that I, I was, you know, easy to mimic, you know, I was, I was sure. fine to follow. So that's a really interesting uh, piece there. So I'm wondering then for someone who, you know, used mathematics in the field, found it very useful, but didn't maybe see themselves as, you know, let's say, you know, sort of um, driven to to do mathematics in school or not seeing maybe the, you know, the value there when you were in school. Um, what would be a math moment that comes to you whenever we, we say, hey, mathematics or learning math or math class, or, you know, you think about math, what's that moment that pops in a, into your mind when you think about mathematics? Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that and you pick up on it, because actually the thing that comes to mind is actually when a colleague in the in the business world, in our firm, gave me Paul Lockhart's Mathematician's Lament mm -hmm. as wrestling with this. And, and, you know, one of the one of his central theses there is that math is an art. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's not typically taught that way in school. Um, and that that really resonated with me. And I think the thing was, I was always sort of a teacher at heart that was trying to sort of avoid that calling or run away from the profession, but it kept chasing me down. 
Uh, and so <laughs> there was, you this- like it or not, it's coming. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, so that there was a, there was a point in time about 15 years ago where it was seeing what was going on in the business world during the 08, 09 timeframe, um, working with financial models and other things and having, you know, younger students who are now graduates, interns coming into our firm and then getting mm-hmm. that mathematician's lament. You're like, okay, I'm starting to draw some connections and we really need to reconsider the way that we introduce these, these concepts to people. So I went back and got a master's degree uh, in education and have been in, in education ever since. Mm, great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. No, we've, we've, we, uh, I think the first time I was introduced to um, a mathematician's lament, uh, I think it was from Sunil Singh when he, you know he yeah, he I was on so. our he was one of our first guests actually. We, you know we we'd known Sunil for a long time and he had he had raved about that and and talked about that and he uses it I think in almost every single one of his presentations. It's it's a it's a very influential uh, you know a piece and and I think it's a, it's it's great that you brought it up here too. So Michael. What's on your mind lately? Like, like, what can we dig into here today? The three of us, uh, we usually say, what's a pebble, you know, that's rattling around in your shoe uh, that we can shake out um, in the next little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So initially, so we're, we're in the midst of not just a departmental initiative, but we're, we are looking at from a, from a school-wide perspective of really trying to take our, our education into deeper learning. Um, which, as you know, we will get through um, the the Thinking Classrooms book, and and Peter Lildahl talks about, you know, thinking is really the prerequisite for for learning. So mm-hmm. we have our we have an art of learning statement that we've crafted here at our uh, K twelve school, and we're trying to we're trying to use that as our philosophical sort of north star, and then how do each of these disciplines line up to support that? Um, Mm -hmm. And the benefit of one of the attractions of coming to this school is the fact that we have we have um, a really good relational connection with staff Uh, that translates to the parents, the students. So it's a really tight community and we can we can really accomplish things rather quickly, which has presented its own challenges um, as we've done this. So um, math is obviously moving towards deeper learning, thinker, thinking classrooms, where all of the things that, that you guys have been having guests on your podcast, which is, which is how I found you, are the things that we are pursuing mm-hmm. and, the, and the, leader, the changes that we're trying to lead. Um, but we found ourselves now, it's in, in some ways, we are actually, the process is going so quickly. How do we, mm. how do we manage it? How do we communicate it to all our stakeholders has been mm. the real, real big challenge. I, I mm. really want to, that's really interesting to me because I, I think, I think when people in education, specifically in mathematics, you know, at least the listeners of this podcast are, you know, have, have some sort of, you know, um, you know, hand in the, in the mathematics space in their district or organization. And my thought is, I, I feel like everyone sort of looks at change as always being so slow but yet you just mentioned there about things moving so fast. Can you dig into that a little more for us? Are you, is it that the process or that we're, what we're hoping for is to see change happening quickly and is that causing problems or, or are we actually moving really fast and, you know, everything's going well. I I think that's a bit of a loaded question. I think it's, you know, I think we know the answer to that, right? Is usually it doesn't always go really well the first time. So tell us more about that, that things are moving fast. What do you mean by that? And I guess, how is that, you know, what sort of pebbles are, are sort of revealing themselves to you as you, as you sort of push forward here? Sure. I think, you know, to, to, if you could, if you could rewind three years across all of our subjects, what, what teachers and administrators were say is that that our school did um, educated students very well in in the traditional forms of what most uh, most parents uh, experienced themselves when they mm-hmm. were in school uh, and what you would expect to see in in most schools nationwide, globally, et cetera. And right. so, what, but what we were trying to move towards is is that authentic student um, engagement with their learning, 
So we've, we've actually, I mentioned that I was the Dean of Math and Science. We also carved out humanity. So our, um, at this particular school, that's social studies, it is English, and it's also Bible. And so they're in a, in a triad of humanities. And they are moving from where it was mostly lectures and, and you know, tests to a lot of reading and discussion-based mm. things, as well as reading awesome. and writing. Mm-hmm. So there, so, and we have a separate dean there who is, who is working with all of those department heads and the administration to lead that. Mm-hmm. And then, so we've got math and science, and I actually came in through business and entrepreneurship and data science. So those were those were the courses that I was and, and still am teaching. Um, so, what does it look like in in math and science and in entrepreneurial innovation? It's a little bit different, but it's the same philosophy. So we're trying to have the students explore and discover and really take the lead. Um, and we've we found a curriculum and we've developed a, a, a way of doing that by, um, you know, looking more in problem sets. And I think it even is what you guys would maybe describe as problem based learning or the real or the real flipped classroom. I've heard you guys. Do. I like it. He's been he's a listener, John. I like this. I like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, keep keep going though. I, I I want you to keep digging here. I'm happy. Uh, I'm I'm really getting a, a clear vision, or at least let me at least tell you what I think I'm hearing so far, and then you can continue elaborating. Is, you know, what what I'm liking. It sounds like you know thinking, which I think you already mentioned, but I, I don't know if it it resonated with me as much as it is now. Thinking is at the core of what you're trying to do across the curriculum, and it sounds like. Um, you've got a lot of the key stakeholders, key people, your um, your your dean of different department areas are on board for this, that, hey, we want that thinking to happen. This isn't just a math class thing, right? Hey, you know, awesome. Peter's really, you know, shine a light in that area. But it, it seems like there's been this sort of, you know, um, spark that sort of igniting other areas to kind of start looking at what they do or what they typically did in practice. And they're starting to go, well, wait a second, how do we actually turn this around a little bit? How do we put more of this on the students so that they're doing the thinking and the teachers become more of the facilitators? So that part sounds fantastic. Tell me about what, so it, it what I'm getting in, in out of this is like, it sounds like you know, a lot of people are on board, so things are moving fast. Where do you see maybe some of the challenges arising here? So what's what what problems are you experiencing? Where where are those pebbles starting to, you know, show uh, or emerge? I think it's so it's one of those deals where the more you dig into it, it's 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 hard to live in a middle ground. Uh, especially when you have such a groundswell, like you get this alignment where everyone starts to realize that, oh, you know, students weren't really thinking as much maybe three or four years ago. You know, they were they were they were compliant and they were working in that conventional mode. They were turning in assignments. They were listening to lectures and they were taking notes. But that's that's different. That's not it's not quite asking the same level of of work that we are that we are wanting them to pursue. You know, it's that classic thing where they're doing your teacher is doing more of the work crafting a great lesson to deliver it to you. So um, and when everyone starts doing it and they put on those glasses, it's they start like we'll see, oh, our students weren't really leaning in and thinking and digesting this. And that becomes contagious across all of the different departments and areas. So now you you have a, a situation where students are kind of almost, they, they come back from their previous year of school and it's kind of like, what's happening here? Mm. You know, it's one thing for that, that one teacher that says, hey, I'm going to do things a little bit differently. I'm going to ask more of you. Um, you're going to benefit from this, but here's how this looks. That starts to be in three, four, five of your classes. Um, the students were really sort of taken aback and it took mm-hmm. it's taken a little while for them to to kind of understand one that oh this is this is more than just one teacher in one class um how do i deal with that and then i think this year more than anything else it's also been um parents wondering about what this looks like and uh-huh. the unique thing about math was we heard this well math is different so 
parents and students could understand that if they were in a history class, that you were going to replace a lecture from a teacher with a reading, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but how would anybody know how to perform a, a, a mathematics operation or tackle a certain kind of problem if it's not explained to them up front? Mm. Okay. okay. So, so what I'm hearing is, is your, it sounds like some folks, you know, that are stakeholders in your building or around your building are, are viewing, you know, what mathematics is, is different right now than what your philosophy, your, your North star mm -hmm. um, in your building. So, so where are you feeling that the problem is, you know, like you've got you, like, what, it, what, it, where's the challenge right now that you're, you're experiencing. So you've got different philosophies happening, but where's like, where's that? Like, oh, I need, I need help exactly here. Like, what can yeah. we help you with specifically? Well, I think some of it is just like in your experience of having, you know, helped and consulted on change in different, different mm -hmm. schools, different school settings, as well as with individual teachers. Um, are there, are there experiences or situations that this brings to mind of like, Hey, maybe, maybe you're going too fast or maybe we're, maybe we're missing a key to sort of unlocking it. Um, and that issue really is, um, there was a, there was talk about the fact that teachers, you know, teachers, it's going to take time for teachers to mm -hmm. adjust. I would say, you know, we talked about mathematics as an art. We obviously know teaching is an art too. Mm -hmm. um, right now, our teachers are mostly struggling in the, in the math department with how do we ask really good questions that are, you know, we, Lil Hall in Thinking Classrooms talks about those questions that can sort of stop the students from thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how do you ask really good questions? And some of that is just being in the classroom mm -hmm. and, and noticing and sort of honing your craft a little bit is my sense of that. Got it. Got it. So, so we've got this philosophical kind of difference in it. And it sounds like what you, you know, when you kind of narrowed in on the teachers is that you're more concerned about, you know, helping teach, you know, the, the math department or the math teachers kind of wrap their minds around how they can use, you know, put thinking at the forefront um, is in, and if that's, if that's the case, like, what have you done so far? to like if, if you've realized that that's that's where your struggle is you know trying to convince mindset kind trying to like think about how do i how do i nudge my teachers to kind of think about mathematics in this way when they've always done it this way like what would you what have you done so far to help nudge those teachers down that pathway okay so first things first is this we we sent everybody off for the summer break this past year with with the thinking classrooms book everybody came back and had read it. And we sort of agreed that, you know, implementing those first three items, the vertical non-permanent surfaces, the randomized groupings, that those things, mm -hmm. those things would be, would be useful and, and could be implemented in every single one of our math classrooms without a lot of disruption. Right. Uh, and that for the most part happened. Um, but it looks different in every single classroom, which, which might be okay. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. You know, in some of those instances, you will have um, students still um, asking for a lot of feedback. Is this right? Is that right? Um, from, from the boards and mm -hmm. how, how do teachers respond to that? You know, um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And these, these are definitely, you know, so I'm getting a, a clear picture too, which is great. So we always like to keep, keep digging here. I'm wondering, one wonder I have is how would you say, like, if you were to just kind of broadly envision um, in the, and let's look at specifically math, but I, I'm sure we could do this activity across, you know, yeah. the, the curriculum, how, how well do you think it's going in terms of, you know, there's one thing about the student, how they maybe feel, mm -hmm. but like, how are they actually doing in terms of achievement? Like are, are students feeling that they're not, you know, is it, is it just a mental block that they're used to just having these nice notes and like, you know, there's, 
you know, copy this down. And if I just study the notes, then I, I know what'll be on the quiz because it's just going to be like the examples out of the notes. And I just, you know, need to memorize that. Is, is it, Is it that or is there like are students feeling actually maybe a little lost in terms of where am I, you know, in terms of the structure? What are we doing? What is the intentionality, maybe the learning objective? And the reason I ask that is because sometimes when we shift away from that very structured math lesson, right, like very structured, like the title of the lesson is dividing fractions, right? And then all of a sudden you go to this other world and it's like, here's a problem. And then furthermore, my wonder is sort of like, are we always call it tying the the bow at the end, like the consolidation, like when students leave a classroom, are they walking away going, that was an interesting problem? Or are they walking away going like, I think I understand the new concept, which is blank. You know, like, what does that look like and sound like currently uh, noting that there is no judgment here? Because, again, the the whole school is very early in the journey. Right. So right. what would you how would you describe that um, currently? Yeah, and it's funny. I mean, it's good that you mentioned consolidation, because that is one other area in addition to the questions that that you know, is a, is a growth area and our teachers are well aware of it there. They're getting used to a new a new pacing, um, but yes. So we have moved from, you know, in some instances, actually giving notes to students. For, you know, the teacher would create the notes and hand them to the students. They may, in some classrooms, have even been able to use those on tests. To to trying to pull some of those things away, in addition to moving. Um, moving the order of what we're doing and putting the students in front. So one of the things is the students who did the, who were strong and were quote unquote good students in that former area are some of the students that are the most uncomfortable with the mm-hmm. change, right? Very they common. For sure. For yeah. sure. Um, so I guess to, what we want to move to is we want to assign problems the night before class. And we want the students to, to attempt them. You know, they, we want them to think about those problems 30 to 45 minutes and bring their work in notebooks into the class where they will go up on the board in a variety of ways, individually, in small groups, sometimes the entire class. And our, our class size is average 14 to 16. So it's, it's, it's small on the small side. Um, and those will all, they'll go through all those problems Um, You'll look at different ways of solving them, but at the end in the consolidation, we want them taking notes and coming away from each class, feeling confident that they know the, know how to, how to tackle each problem. Does that make sense? I think that, I think you're, you've been, I think you're clear, you're clear on, on what you want. Um, And, and what, what would you say is. So is is this something you like you've you know the this they say the administration has has kind of said this is what we want because we've done some learning and then would you say that all the teachers know what you want or some know what you want or you know uh, you know some classes do but some don't like if we asked you know picked five random teachers and said hey what is the focus of math class moving forward would they all answer the same way yeah, I think there's I think there's confusion, and on the teacher side, um, we've been we've been talking about this and having groups and working through it for for several years now. We're we're kind of entering you know year two of of doing this, um, but even before that, we spent a lot of time as a whole school talking about philosophy. But I think the way that when when individual teachers look at adapting these things to their practice, I think we would probably have different. If, if we were to talk to five different math teachers from our team, you might hear three different things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, if, if, I'm, if I'm thinking about problem solving and, and thinking about the one of the things that we're doing on a regular basis, especially to implement Peter's, Peter's work, I think where we've, you know, 
we've Kyle and I've been talking to hundreds of school districts, you know, over the last uh, year, two years, and what they've been doing in their classrooms and what they're doing in their programs. And I think one of the biggest, you know, challenges uh, schools and, and classrooms have had with adopting Peter's work is is thinking about what you articulated there about saying, look, we can take the three things that's going to be that's super easy to implement. And I think that's where a lot of schools will will adopt those three and they think we're doing thinking, you know. We're, we're, we're doing the thinking classroom because we have our, our students up at the walls and they're working on problems. Um, and then what we've come to realize and, and help the districts that we work with is, is there's a lot more nuance, you know, to crafting an experience for students to, to, you know, go through some productive struggle to come out the other side, knowing why, why they went through that productive struggle and exactly what was the purpose and then how that relates to the math I need to know by the end of class today. So like that consolidation piece. So so thinking about like, how do I construct the beginning of class so that my students are engaging in a problem that or or a series of problems? Uh, you know, if you, you know, Peter's work with with, you know, you talking about thin slicing is, is sometimes a, a nice technique that you can engage your your class in a in a in a problem string that can bring out the big idea. But I think where where i think the teachers in in school leaders who've struggled with with making that that move towards the real thinking classroom is in and i'm going to say the intentionality of what the lesson is about and thinking about okay here is here is what i want my students to learn at the end of class how can i craft that experience so that they have a rewarding attachment to the learning that they've done and then also know at the end of that experience what they're supposed to do next. And and and, and we want to make sure that we're not just say, hey, we're going to throw a bunch of questions at you. And then you you have to then solve them at the board. And then we're going to, hey, what technique did you come up with? It's actually a lot more nuanced than that in, in terms of figuring out what model or what strategy do I want them to, to try or, or elicit or how to bring out? And then how do I bring that about? And then if I don't see what model or strategy is coming about, how can I interject and create that experience for them so that I can bring out the learning goal by the end of class today? So so there's a lot more nuance, I think, to what's what's happened. And, and I'm curious to you know hear your thoughts on, on uh, you know, how that relates to what you guys are, are striving for in your classrooms. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think the the one other element to add into this is we are we're using problem sets now that um, that have threads that spiral. So it is in we're, we're shifting to more of an integrated math program. Um, and, and we actually sent teachers this past summer and I was able to attend as well, but we went to the Exeter math Institute, which is run by a, a, a school in New Hampshire that's been mm-hmm. doing it for mm-hmm. 25 years. Um, and that was really the, that was a piece where those teachers that attended with me could really, could really see the, the complexity and kind of the, the artistry of the experience and do so from the perspective of a student. But not all of our our team has been able to do that yet. Um, so so the 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 problems and the way that they're built and attacking them in order, there is a there is a logic to them, and and there's multiple things going on through the problems um, at each time. And so that gives you a good foundation to spend the time to think about um, all the different things that are going on. They also tend to have, you talk about kind of low floor, high ceiling. They have they have logical places where almost every student can enter in, and then you can you can kind of extend and build off of them. So, okay, um, all of these things are to say though that is uh, it it is an adjustment for for teachers to to use them and adapt to the way that the the students are are engaging with the problems. Got it. So. Now, I wonder if we could, you know, so so you had mentioned a little earlier that, you know, thinking about this idea of even students kind of engaging with some of the problems more independently at home and then maybe coming out and then sharing some of that work. And, you know, that that's an interesting, you know, sort of 
sort of approach, uh, um, which, which, yeah, I, I have never, I've never specifically at attempted something like that, but I guess I'm what, what I'm wondering is, is what, what would you say? So we know for like, as a school, we want more thinking, of course, right? So that's clear. That's very, very um, explicit. But when we think about, let's say, thinking classrooms and, you know, say vertical non-permanent surfaces and engaging, you know, getting students to engage, you know, collaboratively, what are we, like, what, how would that happen? Like, if you could wave that magic wand, we talk about the magic wand quite a bit, and everything was sort of just happening as it should, you know, like, what would that look like and sound like in the classroom? And, you know, where, where is that hiccup? Because I, I heard you say something earlier, you talked about some of the students were kind of struggling, even a bit of the parents, but then you just mentioned this, <clears throat> this idea about trying to get, you know, some teachers to kind of get on board in terms of potentially using or utilizing those problem sets. Like, what are we, what are we hoping to see happening in the classroom that maybe isn't happening at the level that you'd like to see it? Um, just so we can really hone in here on, on where the, where that pebble currently lies. Sure. I think, I think when this, when this is working well, we would like to see students um, walking into class, having engaged with five or six problems that are going to be the curricular focus of the day, the night before, um, and whether they, whether they were able to work all of them out or could only get partial way through each of those five or six. They've attempted them, they've thought about them, and now they're going to, they're going to put a problem up on the board. And it isn't for the benefit of the, the teacher to basically verify the work is right. It becomes more of, um, you know, this was my thinking on the problem, communicated by the student. This is where I'm stuck. And that that sort of peer learning where, you know, a student that might have, here's an interesting way that I came up with this and, and solved it. And you get a situation where the students are, are communicating and, and working mm -hmm. with one mm -hmm. another. And the teacher is, the, is the, the expert in the room guiding and supporting that, but from, a, from more of a foundational like they've created that environment that allows the right. students to direct it. And what would you mm -hmm. say is the number one barrier preventing that from happening right now? Um, the, probably the the idea that, well, if I don't have it figured out, um, I need to go and get a tutor ahead of time, or I need my parents to help me, or if none of those things happen and I didn't figure it out, I just need to like stay quiet and and you know, not participate. So you're saying, you're, so what you're right now envisioning is the barrier is the student mindset or something to do with the teacher? Um, student, student mindset right now with where we're at is probably, um, is something that would make it, when you talked about really when this thing is going to fully flourish, mm -hmm. it's when the, it's when the students can click and, and get on board do with you, it. Do you think so? Are you seeing when you go in the classroom, let's let's say the students were presented with some problems and, and, and they thought about them, they come in, they're working on them. What's happening at that time right now that you maybe think makes that student go, man, I need a tutor, you know, like what, what I can't do this on my own. Like, like, what do you think, right? Like, what does that environment look like? Or what is that environment telling the student? And, you know, that they need that because if, if they're going away from the room saying, I need external help because I'm supposed to solve this on my own, like what's happening in the room right now that makes that student say that? And then this is the follow up. What can you change about the environment right now so they don't say that? Right. There isn't anything specific that's going on in in those rooms that's doing that. I, this is where it may, it may just be time, and it may be the fact that you know they that culture needs to be reinforced a little bit more. That could be it. Um, that's kind of a, a, a wonder on my part. Um, but what you will see is if 
if students don't take that that ownership of really trying to assess where am I in this? I mean, do I really understand it or am I still leaning on, you know, you can you can kind of replace leaning on the teacher to try to explain it to leaning on a peer. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think I think, you know, from my experience, when I've had students, you know, solve, you know, tr- solving problems at the boards and, and they're in their, you know, they're, they're feeling def- deflated. Um, and, and there's been cases where I noticed that and I didn't do anything, you know, I didn't do anything about it. I, I let the, I think it was my early days of, of teaching with, you know, the same ideas that you're describing. And, and when that happens, you know, the kid's going to come out of the room and they're going to feel like they're not supported. And when they, and they feel like they're not supported, they're going to go home and they're going to talk to mom and dad and, and mom and dad are like, well, maybe we need a tutor or maybe we need to call the school. Like maybe what's going on about what's happening in the room. If, if they're leaving the room, not understanding what they were supposed to do. Um, and, and this is because, you know, we're changing the dynamic of the room. We're, we're changing the ones that are, who have been struggling, you, you know, they, they were successful because they were mimicking and, and following. And now we've asked him to do some thinking and, and, and what it came down to is when I when I didn't do that and when I addressed and tried to make sure that the students were, in a sense, rescued, that that I'm here as your guide and I'm here to make sure that we tie this up with a bow, that you you it's OK that you didn't get it. It's, it's more important that you tried and that we are now going to take your efforts wherever they lie, you know low floor, high ceiling, but wherever they are in there, we're going to take your, 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 like your, your thinking, your attachment to the value right now around this problem. And we're going to bring you here so that you feel like your, your effort was rewarded because we needed your thinking to get here, but we all have to get here before we can go on to the next day or, or what the next pro- set of problems to work on is. And that's a teacher move. Like that's not a student mindset move. That's a teacher action that has to happen in the room to create that culture that says we're here and we're going to bring everybody here. Mm. And I'm going to make sure that wherever you were, we're going to leave here going, this is where we were. This is what happened. These are the strategies you tried. These are the strategies I want to highlight today because that's the learning goal here today. These are the models that we used to get at those, to allow us to use those strategies and and achieve that particular learning goal. Here's the learning goal. Here's your next steps. But everybody has to get there. So if you've got students kind of in that sense going like, I'm feeling like I'm not supported in that, that world they are going to say, I need extra help. I, they are going to go home and complain and, and parents are going to call and go, what's happening in the school? It's the t- the kid has to leave the room on a regular basis going like, I, I understand what we were supposed to do here today. I feel like this is my place. Mm. I feel like I'm supported along the journey so that tomorrow or the tonight's problems that I get, I have to then, I, I know that if I tempt them tonight, tomorrow I'm going to go in and I'm going to feel supported again. And then we've got a real culture of learning and a real culture of like, I can work at the boards. I can solve problems because I know that wherever I get to, I'm going to be brought to the right spot. And I know that my, my value is, is rewarded along that journey because the teacher used my ideas, my thinking to help support the big idea of the lesson of the day. The image I just got in my head was this image, you know, when we talk about the hero's journey and the idea of the tension Mm -hmm. time graph, right? And in a math class, it's actually, it's a great thing if we can allow that tension to rise during the productive struggle. And the problem is if that tension doesn't ever come back down, right? And, And that's where that consolidation comes in. When John, you're talking about that support or you're talking about that, you know, the tying it with a bow, this idea that if I leave today's classroom and let's say I'm not feeling super comfortable with what happened today. And then tonight, you know, if if the approach we're using is, is we're going to give you a few more problems for tomorrow. uh, And I'm not clear on today, right. You can see probably like that compound effect, you know, the snowball gets bigger and bigger, the tension gets higher and higher. Now, that may or may not be the case here. You know, we're just, you know, 
discussing a, a scenario of, of what could be potentially happening, but there is, you know, one thought maybe to just float out there and maybe it's, it's something to reflect on. And maybe some of your, your leaders in the building might want to reflect on it is, you know, sometimes when we say thinking, right, it's kind of like the word rigor. It, it happens with the word rigor a lot. Like sometimes we get it wrong, you know, on what we really mean by that. Cause like a lot of people will say rigor and what they equate that to is like giving kids as many problems as possible. Like so, that's very rigorous. But mm -hmm, that's not mm -hmm. really rigor at all. And when we think about thinking, thinking is something we want to allow students to do. And you had already said it earlier, which is great to kind of reiterate it. But the real flipped classroom we talk about is this idea that we give them the opportunity to think first, but then we, the the expert in the room, as, as you had already articulated, we're there to help kind of determine like, where are you? Like, let's take where you're at. Let's try to build off of where you are and let's connect it to the new learning. But that's like, I got to do a lot of thinking for that. Like, it's not the students that are going to necessarily do that. It's, it's a beautiful thing when it does happen. Like when students are like, oh yeah, because of this, it's that. And because of this, it's that, you know, but those are few and far between when that happens. And even when it does happen, we as the as the facilitator have to reiterate it to say it like again to make sure that it's like i heard what you just said and what you just said sounds a lot like what i was going to say but i'm going to re like i'm going to articulate it again even more clearly and i'm going to make sure i'm looking all these kids in the eyes so that they i can see and i can read john talked about the teacher moves like one of the teacher moves is assessing when you look at them, if they're all looking through you, mm -hmm. that's telling you something, right? If they're all looking at you with fear in their eyes, that's telling you something, right? If some kids are turning white, you know, that's telling you something as well. And, you know, a thought I would, I, I'm wondering about, and I don't know the impact, and this might be something, you know, John, next time we talk to Peter, uh, might be something that we chat about is, you know, I'm wondering what the impact I think it's, I think it would be amazing. Like if in a perfect world, students had a problem set at home and they explored them. And, and as long, I guess, as long as the mindset and the understanding was clear that, listen, you don't have to get all of these right, you know, the night before, but it sounds like the intent there is that students are, you know, dipping their toes in, giving them a good go. Um, but I, I just wonder in terms of the dynamic of like how that changes things, when we do the thinking classroom the next day, and and I'm I'm just gonna throw one scenario that pops into my mind is like John goes home, he spends all night on these problems and like he's he's in. And it's like that's exactly what you want as a teacher, right? You're like, amazing, John, you're the best. I love you. And then I come in and like I was the kid, and this was me as a kid. I'd be like, nah, I don't know how to do it yet. I'll just wait till tomorrow. And I wouldn't look at him at all. And I'm wondering about the dynamic that that creates in the classroom when John comes in and he knows the answer to all the problems. And then I'm in a group and I'm the kid that doesn't even know the context of the problem because I didn't read any of them. And then we come together and then we're going to work in a thinking cl classroom collaborative random group. And I'm wondering about that dynamic as well. And sometimes kids have a hard time, whether they're you know old, young, adults, sometimes we forget, you know, that if somebody puts in three more hours of work than you, then of course, they're probably going to know, know a few more things than you, but you don't think about that in the moment. You just think like John gets it and I don't, but in reality, like John's done a lot more work than me. So that's yeah, a wonder I have, and I don't know what the implication is there, but it's something that I think is worth at, worth at least digging into as a team well, to kind of go like, is this helpful? Is this, you know, helping or hurting or, you know, what sort of impact might that be having on the the culture that you're trying to create in that thinking classroom? Yeah. So. You're yeah. And, and I think what Peter would say is that you're missing out on, you know, those, those epiphanies that, that are happening in the moment when students are seeing the problem for the first time together. Um, and then the, those, what are those problem solving moves that some of us do that some of us don't do? And how can we, those, 
you know, those little interactions, you know, those interactions aren't happening if we all see it at, at home in advance and come in with possible solutions. It's, it's, it, you know, problem solving is messier than that. You know, problem solving is, is us going like, well, I thought I, I would think about it this way. And then you, you're voicing that. And then the other ones, you know, other ones are hearing that at the same time. And, and that those interactions spur on, you know, new learning for each other. Like there's, there's a lot of value in, 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 the, in those problems. And then I also, you know, I, I think, like I said before, there's a lot of nuance in, in how you craft those problems, because, because say if there's five, let's say there's five problems, but those five problems, if they're, if they're just say plucked from say a problem set or from a textbook, there's probably no, I'm going to guess there's no, there's no flow from one problem to the other, unless it's like, these are from part A, these are from part B, and these ones are from part C. They get harder as they go instead of a nice, very carefully crafted progression of problems that the solution of one helps, you know, identify how to solve the next in a way that it's slightly changed. You know, there's maybe a strategy different or, you know, there's another nuance to this strategy, but then all of a sudden it changes a little bit, but we still need to use this strategy here, but it's now a little bit different to the strategy, like thinking about a very well-crafted number talk or a math talk was way, way we, we would say it, you know, Peter would call that, you know, a thin slicing, you know, Kathy Fosno would call that Kyle, a, a problem string, a problem you know, a string, string yeah. a problem string, you know? So, um, like there's, there's some very carefully crafted ways to make the thinking come out so that students are really making the connections that you want them to make. Um, and, and, uh, that, that I, I think say picking, say five problems to work on. And then at home, you might want to wait until the class shows up and very carefully crafted those, what that progression looks like. Well, the good news is that the, the problems are well-crafted and thread. That's good. But I do think we've kind of landed on, I mean, I think what you guys both described is that growing pain right now. The, your scenario about the students who are doing the homework versus the ones who aren't, that's that's a discrepancy that the teachers are, are uh, struggling with. Mm -hmm. And I think you're absolutely right. At the end of the day, we we do also have to, we're trying to build a culture, but we have to meet the students where they're at. Right. Um, and I would say also it 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 isn't a like the consolidation piece, and and what happens after each problem is a big area of focus. So from a from a coaching standpoint, what I want to do is I do want to build that up. At the same time, from a leadership standpoint, I want to I want to engender as much confidence in our teachers who are doing what we ask them to do as much as the students. So, so to come in and basically say, Hey, we got to start, you know, our consolidation has to get tighter and better and you need to spend more time. You know, there's that, there's that sensitive balance there. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, you, you just, uh, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think, I think you know, what I'm, I'm wondering from you is, you know, I was about to ask you, you know, so what do you think your next step might be? And I, I, I want to at least maybe even put it out there that potentially somewhere to start is, is not, you know, going in and saying, Hey, you know, we need to do this or we need to do that. It sounds like you already know that that's not a, you know, a super slick move. It's not going to be very helpful, but my wonder is whether you engage you know, groups of teachers doesn't have to be all together, maybe in little, you know, grade level groups or, or however you meet, if you have PLC time and, you know, maybe trying to get them to share some of these struggles themselves. So, you know, just like we tried to draw that out from you today was sort of like, okay, so like, what's really sort of like, you know, like we know there's tons of problems, right? Like, you know, we, we've got problems every day in schools and all over the place and, you know, in every subject area, but really trying to hone in on like, what's the one that's sort of like, you know, kind of on my mind now. And we've sort of brought out a few of those. And I wonder if they would be similar if you engaged in a similar conversation with some of those teachers. And then I wonder if they would be open to, you know, having that discussion to kind of figure out like, hmm, is there something we as a team might consider doing differently versus it being like, uh, you know, a uh, 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 Michael comes in and says, this is, you know, what you should do. Right. And a lot of times 
what you can get is you can actually get a lot of teachers to kind of come, come out with a lot of the things that you were kind of thinking in your, you know, in your mind might be good moves anyway, might take a little longer. And, and that might go back right to your initial, you know, sort of, you know, prompt where you had said, you know, things are moving so fast. And maybe this is one of those scenarios where it might have to slow down just a little bit so that you go, okay, we got to slow down so that we can go fast. So if we're dealing with these pebbles, you know, like, what are they, you know, like, you know, you might know what they are clearly, but maybe they haven't named them yet. They've just sort of, it's really easy to like, you know, to name the, the challenge, the challenge is the kids are, you know, not enjoying it, or the kids are feeling like they need tutors. Like, okay, well, okay. So why is that? You know, and we kind of rewind, we rewind, we rewind. And if they're at the center of that, if those teachers are there at the center, I think you'll get some, you know, little epiphanies. It's, it's just like a great, well-crafted math lesson, right? Like you, you're thinking ahead going like, well, I can see some of the challenges are these things. So what are the questions I ask in that role as, as a, a curriculum leader to sort of draw out some of those things and, and help people just say them out loud. And sometimes after they say them, and then you ask the next question and they say that, and they start to go, oh, like, and the, you know, it sort of is right in front of their face and it might actually just give you a next step. So I'm wondering, we'll flip it back to here, you here, Michael, uh, before, before we sign off and, you know, what would you say is, you know, maybe your next step? What, what are you thinking on, you know, maybe, you know, what are you grappling with right now that uh, might be helpful as, as you try to continue on this journey, which of course is a challenging one, right? Trying to make Absolutely. change in any practice. Absolutely. No, I, I agree a hundred percent with, with what you've just said. And I think, I think that should be an area of focus. And I think um, <clears throat> sometimes too, there's that, oh, we have to fix this right away, you know, um, and it's a, it's a process and getting them involved, maybe, maybe forming a group, um, kind of a working group of, Hey, how can we, um, how can we make sure that, I mean, I would, would you put it out there of, Hey, if we, how could we make sure that students didn't leave our classroom feeling like they needed outside help, mm. you know, in any sense. Um, and that might be a lot, or maybe goal. just asking and saying like, why, like, why do you suppose they're feeling that way? You know, and, and like, even just asking it as a question too. Right. Uh, so like, yeah. those are all great strategies. I love that. Awesome. Yeah, awesome absolutely. stuff. Sounds like you've got some next steps there, Michael. So uh, we're excited to actually, we're excited to check in with you. Uh, we, we love to kind of uh, bring you back on and, and say, uh, next year and, and to kind of see where things have landed, um, and see where things, you know, have morphed from, from where they are now. Uh, would you be okay with that? Oh, I'd love it. That'd be great. Awesome. This is extremely helpful. And, and, uh, would like to, to have you guys along. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us, uh, Michael, and, uh, we'll be in touch. Yeah, awesome. we can't, uh, can't wait to catch up with you in the podcast room at the school again, sometime <laughs> soon for those who are watching on YouTube looks, uh, pretty awesome. So, Good on Absolutely. you and great chatting with you, my friend. Thanks, Thanks so much. Really appreciate it.